Welcome to the Strategic Project Leader, where we help you leverage strategic project management so you can achieve your goals. Now, here's your host, Fola Alibi. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to another episode on the Strategic Project Leader. First up, I want to just say thank you for taking time to spend your Saturday with us today. Today's going to be pretty interesting because we're going to be talking about a topic that is one that I have had to um, deal with and we deal with this on every single basis, every single day. On a strategic project leader, we help project managers, we help business analysts, professionals elevate to become strategic project leaders, even business executives, because we need to leverage project management skills in project delivery to help organizations achieve strategic goals and objectives, to help them align back to whatever it is was their vision from the start, and above all, help you as a leader create the life you've always craved for. I am Fola Alibi. I'm your host and formerly called the Strategic Project Leader. I'm a consultant. I am pretty much your cheerleader, cheering you on, giving you tools and strategies to elevate in business, in your career, and in your life. Do you know what my superpowers is? strategic project leadership. That's right. Today, I'm going to be leaving you with great strategies. And beyond that, I have got a leader, just, I don't even know where to start, but just brace up as I get into this. I have got um, Mike Roberto, and let me tell a little bit about him. He's a leader who has helped influence a lot of people for decades. Beyond that, he is a tr- um, he is a professor of management at the Brand University at the moment. He is the author of so many books. One of them is all about unlocking creativity. Obviously, spoiler alert, right? That's what we're going to be talking about unlocking creativity today. Professor Roberto co-authored an award-winning um, Everest Leadership and Team Simulation that has been published by many best-selling. Um, authors and books all over the world. And above all, it's actually a case study for the Harvard Business School. Obviously, as you know as well, he's actually part of a team that has worked on so many initiatives and he's going to be unraveling some of the research that he's been doing when it comes to decision making. So we're going to get in a piece of that. He has worked for so many global organizations and consulting firms from Deloitte to Google to Apple. My goodness, he's done workshops for them as well to help them elevate. He holds an MBA and a doctorate from Harvard Business School. So we're going to get a piece of Harvard today, all the way from Boston. Can you please join me as I welcome this great leader and now a friend as well to the Strategic Project Leader. Hello, Mike. How are you doing this morning? Hi, Fola. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing awesome today. And please let us know where you're actually joining us from today because it is definitely an honor. Oh my goodness, I've got Farhad all the way from West Africa. Great to be here. Oh my goodness, I've got um, Edgar as well. Thanks for being here as well. Today, our goal is to give you tools and strategies that you can actually use and leverage in your business in your career, it doesn't matter if you're a project manager, if you're just an individual contributor, or if you're actually a business executive. Let's get into it, Mike. So, Mike, when we talk about creative decision making, what are the two things you think we need to probably know off the bat? I think you know two things off the bat. One is that um, creativity is sparked by the clash of ideas. It's okay to have others with whom you disagree. And it's important to welcome divergent perspectives. Very important. And the second thing I think is really important is that we have to beware that our tendency when we closely study others is to actually imitate rather than innovate. And that's a barrier to creativity. So welcome dissent and beware of the tendency to imitate or be a copycat, I think are two key ideas. Oh my goodness. I know at times people say you see a leader, you see something that you really love, you just just copy and keep going. And so where do you then draw the line, Mike, then? So when you talk about creativity and trying to emulate like great leaders like yourself, where do we draw the line to ensure that we can actually absorb the right things and become great leaders as well? Right. I mean, people talk about this as the benchmarking curse, right? We're, we're always benchmarking. But the problem is when we benchmark, and I, I give this example, um, Hollywood. 
you can't find a place where there's more copycat behavior, right? If you look at the broadcast networks from the 60s through the 90s, you see these waves of copycat behavior. Do you know that in the in the mid 1960s, only one percent of the primetime schedule was police dramas, cop shows. By the mid 70s, it was a third of the primetime schedule because a few hits in the late 60s, like Hawaii Five-0, spurred this huge wave of copycat behavior. But all this copycatting in the 60s through the 90s opened up the door for HBO to revolutionize TV and others, right? Because they got caught in that. And so what we instead have to do, we do have to benchmark. We should study others, but we have to ask ourselves, what are we learning from them that we are then going to use and adapt rather than copying? We're always asking, what can we learn and how do we adapt that to our business rather than just trying to emulate what they're doing? So I think the key there is about value. What I can already hear there is value, right? In every situation from every leader, you need to think about what exactly are those qualities that are valuable that you can pretty much leverage in your career, in your business, whatever it is. And so how do you kind of decide for that? Because at times you see someone who you feel may be a leader who has maybe led great transformations, who have done great things in the industry, and you feel that you start from their personality trait. Is it because they're, they're, they've are got great attention to detail? So how do you imbibe that? And how that's a, that's one question. The next one will be how can we also get a culture where our teams can see that and also emulate that? I think the key is to start by sort of knowing yourself, knowing who you are and your company, your organization, and your competitive market, right? So, you know, you can look and say, wow, those folks at Apple, they're doing amazing things, but that's a totally different business, a totally different culture, right? A different market. So you have to ask yourself, wait, who are who am I, right? As a person, who, who are we as a business and where do we compete? And we have to always think first about that before we go out and then understand. We should learn from others outside our business. We shouldn't just be studying our direct competitors. There's power and great creativity from what we call um, learning by analogy, meaning going out and finding people who are doing something what looks radically different than us and, and learn. So, for example, you want to be great at customer service? Go study the Ritz-Carlton right? Because they're great at customer. You might not be in the hotel business, but wow, do they know how to deliver exceptional customer service. So it's okay to go outside and find people in other industries, but then you have to understand, but who are we, right? And how do we then make it work for us? I think the key there is probably going back to your values, going back to the mission and the vision of, you know, the, the course to what makes us an organization in the first place? Because until that is clearly articulated, you're going to just keep moving around. It's going to be, okay, what's the, what's the shining thing now? Is the artificial intelligence? So is it a case that, you know, we have to pivot this way? So going back to the core for us to understand, okay, where exactly are we going? What are we trying to deliver to our customers? How can we then get a team together so we can achieve that? And then now you can go see who is out there doing exactly that, that we can actually learn from and then get those lessons, right? And see what can we really adapt into our situation? I think that's the key thing. I love that already. And so the key there is, so how do we then make that a culture? And so, because I have seen a lot of organizations really struggle where they say, you know, we want to be innovative. We want to be more creative, but there is a, maybe like a disconnect where people at the, on the, the Eiffel tower who are just executing kind of have this vision. And then the people right there in the field are like, what's going on here? Like, it's totally different. How can we create that overall strategy that connects the foot soldiers right up to the Eiffel, um, the Eiffel tower? I think the really key is as a company is to create an environment where we're willing to uh, embrace, encourage, and fund small experiments all the time, right? What we don't want, we're, we're not telling people on the front lines to go make huge bets on new things we've never done before. That's risky. And frankly, that's undisciplined, right? But what we instead can say is, hey, we're going to have a sandbox where we can play, right? Mm. With a few low risk, low cost fast experiments. And we're not going to do those one-off. We're going to have a, a repeated cycle of those over time. And we're going to encourage people to, to pitch ideas, but we're going to do little experiments. We're not going to sit there and deliberate for 18 months about that idea. Instead, we're going to go test it with real people and let the customer decide whether it's a good idea or let the vendor decide whether it's a good idea rather than us thinking we can sit around you know, in this 
room with all these books and just think <laughs> our way to the right answer. That's not the way innovation happens. We learn by doing, not just by thinking. My goodness, that really ties me to, I remember my class on critical thinking when during my undergrad, because I have an undergrad in philosophy, interestingly. And I think about my critical thinking class and I tie, I think about decision making as well. And, you know, you said we don't think our way to ideas and we don't think our way to solutions and we have to kind of work it through. How do we tie in critical thinking and decision making? Where do we get that fine balance to get things done? So we, we, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't think through our ideas, right? We do have to think them through. Um, and so for me, critical thinking starts with recognizing we always have to look at multiple options or alternatives, right? It's very easy for the human mind and frankly for groups to prematurely converge on one option. And that's dangerous. Now, so we have to have multiple options. Now, too many options and we get overwhelmed. We've all sat there on Netflix and just scrolled for a half an hour and not chosen a show, right? So, right? But there's a there's a sweet spot in between, right? Where we need multiple options, right? To be able to consider. We have to understand what are our assumptions and probe and test those assumptions. Wait, we're assuming people will buy this. Why are we assuming they'll buy this? We're assuming the customer will behave in this way or the employee right. will behave in this way. Is that right? So we have to understand alternatives to understand assumptions, right? Very, very importantly. And, and then we have to understand uh, what are the unknowns, right? What are the things that, and some of those we're willing to tolerate. We go, okay, we can never have full information. Others we go, no, we better learn more about that before we move forward, right? So it's okay to move forward without perfect information, but we have to at least understand that we've made that as a conscious choice saying that's an unknown. We're willing to tolerate that risk. Versus, no, that's an unknown where we better do a little more research. I love that because as project professionals, anyway, we do a lot of risk analysis, right? You, you try to understand, you know, what exactly was the probability of this impact to my project? What's the, what's the impact going to be and what's the dollar amount? And so incorporating that into decision making, I think that's almost like a no brainer when you think through it. Because you need to understand what exactly, you know, the impact could actually be. It may not even be financial. It could be one that could impact you know, the business and a different social license to operate or whatever. But the, the key here is understanding, as you said, the unknowns. You said understanding the risk and then making a conscious decision to say, okay, we've accepted this and depending on what the impact will be, okay, we're going to deal with that. Then I think that's, that's actually great. What would you then say? So when we then understand, you know, we have our options, we know what the alternatives are and we analyze the risk in making decisions, what would you say is the next step? What should we think about? Well, just to, real quick before, on that risk issue, one technique that I think I could share that I think people will love, Hola, um, a man named Gary Klein invented this uh, little technique, which I really love, and I've, I've taught managers it around the world, is a, it's called the pre-mortem. So we all know what a post-mortem is or an after-action review. Project managers use them all the time, right? We, we call them different names. Basically, what we do is we assess how things have gone and we try to figure out how to improve, right? Wonderful. The pre-mortem is you haven't started the project yet. You've got a plan. And what you do is you imagine you've executed the plan or the project and you imagine you failed. <gasps> you ask yourself, what are we saying six months from now or nine months from now at the postmortem? So you sort of role play out what you're going to be doing nine months from now and explaining a potential failure. It's a great way to highlight, oh my goodness, those are the pitfalls that we might encounter. And then you can ask yourself, okay, how do we avoid those, right? How do we anticipate and then hopefully prevent them if we will? So that to me is a little technique to help us before we dive in on a project. I love that. I think we also need to add, why don't we also simulate success? Because I love the positives, right? To kind of say, imagine six months from now, right? The product has gone fantastically well. What are the great things that we've actually done? What were the things that we did proactively, right? I think we've, I need to, I'm going to use the, the devil's advocate and do the both sides of the coin and see on my next initiative as well. Oh, very <laughs> important, by the way. Uh, um, there's a reason why the U.S. Army calls it the after action review and not the mm. post mortem. Oh, yes. The reason is not just because of it's a euphemism, right? It's because actually research shows, you know, the, the, the cliche is we learn more from our failures than our successes. It's actually not correct. We learn by comparing and contrasting our successes and failures. Mm. Right? We compare our mistakes with when we did well and we learn the most 
right? So uh, I agree with you, Fola. We have to also understand our successes. We can't only think about failure. That's actually not the way we learn most effectively. Yeah, I love that. I love it so much because the way my brain is also wired, right? Because I think there's just the dopamine that gets released, right? You know, when things are great, Tim's are motivated as well. Not like the downer that says, oh my goodness, guess what? We just went over budget by $20 million or something. But I, def I love that. How exactly? So I want to bring a bit of data analysis into play because we know we talk about data analytics, you know, even in decision making as well. You have done several research. You've got a data as well around decision making. How can teams effectively um, use like data to uh, to actually enhance critical decision making? So I oh, first step, I think we have to recognize that we're in a world where we have more data at our fingertips than ever before. Yeah. But <laughs> there's a big but to that. And one of those is that as humans, we're subject to something called the confirmation bias. And what is that? What that says is that we tend to focus on data that confirms what we already believe. And we tend to discount or downplay data that contradicts what we believe, right? Not only what we believe, we focus on things, not only that we believe, but that we desperately want to believe. Hmm. And so we look at data in a distorted way and we go, Fola's research, I love it because it tells me I'm right. <laughs> and, and, you know, Sally's research, <laughs> I have some doubts because Sally's research is challenging my worldview. Or, or my pre-existing position. So first step, I think, as we look at data is recognizing this bias we have, right? This slant toward looking at things and going, God, I love the data that tells me I'm a genius, right? And that gets us in trouble. Yes, that's right. And so just trying to just have an open mind, I think it also comes back to a learning mindset, right? Where as leaders, we show up and we say, you know, fine, today's a good day. Let's remove every preconceived notions and stuff and say, I just want to have a first perspective. I want to deliver a project well. I want to help my organization move further faster. And what that means is I just have to just focus on what's in front of me and get that information, the data that I have and see, okay, how does this help the organization? As you said, we need to analyze, we need to ensure that you look at the risk, look at whatever the, impl um, the implications could actually be and make those decisions. And so in, in, in drawing, you know, analogies from that, where you've already said, be open-minded, right? Don't actually just have that piece where you say, because of this kind of where I want to go, I know I want the organization to, to spend $50 million and, on this key initiative. And so I'm going to look for information that's going to help me get there. How can we create or how can we shift our mindset? Or how have you been able to help your students and leaders create that, what would I call that? Like a fluid mind, if I yeah. use that word, right? Where you are more fluid and open to just taking information so we can actually achieve the outcomes that we want. So two things, let me talk. One about mindset and two about some techniques, if you will. So Good. mindset, yes. um, you know, Satya Nadella is the CEO at Microsoft and, and he says, you know, the learn it all leader does better than the know it all leader. And, and I think what, what the point there is when we look at a project or a problem, instead of starting with the question, what do I know about this problem or this situation? What I've been coaching leaders to do is start with the question, what do I not know? Awesome. What are the gaps in my expertise and from whom can I learn to fill that gap, right? So my, my colleague, Amy Edmondson at the Harvard Business School, Amy says, uh, what good leaders do is acknowledge their own limits before they confront a problem. So that I think is a mindset issue. I have limits. I have gaps. How do I fill those gaps? Instead of starting with what I know, it's start with the gaps. How do I fill those gaps? So that's the mindset issue. On the technique side, I think we have to have some techniques to make sure we're, we're opening ourselves up to divergent perspectives. So one of the ones I love is the devil's advocate, having someone on your team who can play the devil's advocate, right? And by the way, it shouldn't be the same person all the time. Why? Because if you always rely on Fola to be the devil's advocate on the team, Fola, we might love you, but eventually you become the broken record and we start right. tuning you out because we go, oh my goodness, in Fola's world, it's always raining and cloudy. You know, like, we're just sorry. She's Dr. Doom. Like, we can't take it anymore, right? So we tune you out. So we need to have a devil's advocate, but we don't need a devil's advocate. What we really need is people who are embracing okay. the role over time, different people. But they have to be constructive. They can't be naysayers, right? The naysayer is just trying to push their own agenda and block other people's agendas. The devil's advocate is opening everyone up to, to just 
asking good questions, right? And not trying to simply slam the door, right, on something, right? They're not just saying no. They're solution-oriented, meaning they might raise some ideas that are concerning, or right? But then they're helping the group say, but how do we overcome those? Instead mm-hmm. of saying, why might this not work? A devil's advocate that's constructive says, well, how could we make it work given these constraints, risks, or problems? Exactly. And so you said you're also going to talk about a tool as well. Yeah. So so to me, a devil's advocate is a tool, but a couple of others uh, to mention. Another is to say to your team, okay, we have three options here. Let's break into three subgroups. Each group take an option, flesh it out a little bit, and then let's swap options and critique each other's ideas. It's a great way to quickly evaluate multiple options. But instead of doing it by just sitting around the table, you actually have people go off, you know, spend a little time, get a little detail to that option, then hand it to another group and say, okay, here's our idea. Tell us what's wrong with this idea. And you, and then swap, right? And now we come back and go, oh, wow. Now we have three, we're three richer options right, from which to choose, right, in a way. Um, which I really like as a technique for sparking creative ideas. I know that's really, really great, especially when you're trying to even just brainstorm and just get different perspectives as well. That's definitely a good one. What I want to actually know now is, so when we have that, I want to think about indecision. Because now we've been talking about making one, where we're like, fine, we have options, so we're going to go this way. Yeah. What about when it's like, Mike, like there's just so many things going on and then, there's this indecision cloud that comes through. How do we deal with that? What is that all about? Yeah. So this is my new project and and the, and the next book. Is, and I've been uh, collecting data on this and really working on trying to understand this. I think there's a few different drivers of indecision. I mean, one of them is that we do get overwhelmed by too much choice. I mean, as humans, we love, well, especially in the Western world, um, we love choice, uh, right? We, we, we have this view that it's sort of... Um, you know, it's fundamental to our nature is to want lots of options. And I'm somebody who loves that. But we also know that we can get overwhelmed by choice, right? And I use that Netflix analogy, right? That we just, or metaphor, you know, where we just scroll forever. So I do think we have to think about like, at some point, you have to stop looking for more options and start evaluating the options in front of you. (laughs) That's so important, right? It's really key. That's one driver of indecision. The other is this, we, we crave certainty, so we want more and more information before we make the decision because we we like to be in control, right? And we want certainty. And we have to sort of be willing to say, no, we're only going to get 80% of that, right? Before we have to move and recognize that it's just, no, we're never going to get to 100. So that we have to fight this. Our brain is telling us, get to certainty, get to control, right? We love that. And then I think the last piece that, that can lead to indecision, I mean, there are many other factors, but one last one I'll, I'll mention, Fuller, that is important in the context of when we're working in an organization, right, that can lead to that, is <laughs> that we can have this issue of um, of the sort of the, the, the dominant sort of way of doing business, right? Um, we're so worried about protecting that. Right. Yeah. It's like we stop willing to take chances because we're like, well, but, you know, we, we got to protect the brand. We got to protect the, the the current business model. And and then we just keep pushing off any effort to innovate because it's like, well, I don't know. I don't know that we want to take so it becomes this extreme risk aversion that can take place. So when we find ourselves our teams a situation where there's this indecision phase, right, we know there's probably a major issue probably that sits in front of us and the team members can just, they they can just move past it. What will be the steps that can be taken to help move past that hump to get to decisions? So first thing I love to ask this question and this concept, there's a concept in economics we call opportunity cost, right? So what is an opportunity cost? This is, you know, what is the foregone, foregone opportunities, right? So if I choose to spend my day, you know, going for a run, right? As a result, I can't do some other things in that time, right? I've dedicated an hour of my time to my run. I have foregone some other opportunity. So I think an important thing to combat indecision is to say, okay, if we don't make this decision now, right, what's the opportunity cost? What opportunities are we missing because we're we're not acting, 
right? Really important to ask that question because otherwise we think there's no cost of inaction, but there is a cost to inaction, to status quo, to not do anything. The competitors may race by us. The customers might defect. Employees might get frustrated and leave or disengage, right? There's cost to not doing anything. We have to talk about those to make sure we understand why being indecisive can actually be really harmful at times. So then you've spoken about opportunity cost. I love that. So that way you obviously know, listen, if we decide not to do anything, that's okay. Just like we talk about ESG, right? Some people just feel that, well, we can actually pay the government X amount of dollars if we don't actually have our carbon credits. That's okay. If that's, it's probably if the cost is maybe lower than what they need to do to get the carbon credits. Cause I had this conversation with some, a couple of my clients, but the key though is we need to be aware that whatever that decision is, there could be an implication for it. And as long as you're willing to accept that, that exactly is that decision and that the cost of it. So what else would you say when we think about opportunity costs, what else are, are you going to give some people more tools? So opportunity yeah, costs, yeah. what else, what else? I think the other thing, you know, when we get caught in this, like we're, we're indecisive and we're not sure what we're going to do. I come back to this idea of, um, well, could we run a little test or experiment to sort of help us resolve some of our worry and uncertainty, right? What would that look like, right? Can we try something at a lower risk, at a lower cost that would let us get us comfortable with moving forward or maybe tell us, no, no, we actually, this is a really bad idea. So I think that's really key, right? Is to be able to do that, is to figure out, can we test it out, right? In a way that gets us a little more comfortable with moving forward. I think it's really key because a lot of the time we always want to go big or go home. I have also had to, I call myself a recovering perfectionist where so many things I've always wanted to do, it has to be, you know, perfect and I'm so scared to put out this content or to create this. I'm even writing a book. And I actually came up with a 70-30 rule. And I look at it I'm like 70-30 at 70% for I think it's okay to put it out there. But what do I do? I just take steps. So I ensure that at least I review what it is. I get like subject matter expert, I get leaders who can actually help me validate and say, I think you're kind of there. You know, you have that piece and you can actually put it out there. So I get that review process. And so I put some things in place to help me get to be more comfortable like a pilot to get there. So in my brain, I'm like 70%. I think that's kind of a pass in the university, right? Once you're 70, I think that's okay. And I want to eat it. I think I heard this a while ago where I said, eat it until it's great. You're going to keep evolving. You're going to keep improving on that idea until we can actually get it out there. I sat down in the shop just yesterday at Apple and I saw a lady who came in. She came in, she bought over probably 50 iPhones. I'm telling you. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And the store was booming. People were coming in and out. And I remember Nokia, Mike. I'm like, think about Nokia a couple of years ago. Hmm. Who would have thought yeah. that Apple will be the front runner today? I just, I, and I look back at them. I said, I need to go, go and do some more research and understand what exactly it was. Were they just so comfortable with the fact that they had a phone and it wasn't okay to even innovate a little bit more? But just iterating and just keep getting better. I think that's another critical source that a lot of organizations need to have, need to leverage as well in order to actually stay relevant. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. And I, I always love to say, I'm a big believer in this idea of iterating, right? I also love to say that humans hate to iterate, <laughs> even though it sounds wonderful in theory, right? Iterate early and often, right? The problem with iteration is it requires us being willing to be listened to feedback, right? And so what happens? Classic example, we have an idea, we go test it out with customers, okay? And we get negative feedback. But the problem is by then we're already in love with our idea. And so we're, we're not listening to that negative feedback or we hear it and we say to the customer, no, no, you don't understand, but this is the way we want you to use the product. No, no, not, you're not using it correctly or you're not, no, 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 the customer's always right. What are we talking about, right? But we're, we're rationalizing what we hear. We're not actually iterating effectively. I, I give you a classic old example, right, of being open, right, that led to really good iteration. But at first they weren't open. There's this famous story about Kleenex, right? So we now, I mean, it's like the, the word Kleenex is synonymous with tissues, right? And blowing That's your right. Nose and you have a cold. Actually, did you know, Fola, that Kleenex were not originally designed 
to help you when you have a cold. Do you know what their original use was, Vola? No, 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 please tell me, please. You'd find this interesting. It was for makeup removal for okay. women a okay. hundred years ago. And that was all their advertising was all about this. And these Neanderthal husbands started blowing their nose with the Kleenex, right? And and uh, and the key was to go, wait a second, the market for blowing your nose is a lot bigger than the market for makeup removal. That's and right. so they iterated and their marketing and their branding changed. And Kleenex became this dominant player in a much bigger market as a result. But, you know, we have a problem. We fall in love with our original idea and we tune out feedback. So iterating requires us not to fall in love with our original idea, but be willing to accept that it might not be a great idea. And don't correct the customer, but actually say, wait, okay, the customer is doing something we didn't expect, or they're reacting in a way we didn't expect. What does that mean? Right? And don't just rationalize it in a way. We're not very good at that at times, right? We, in fact, sometimes we just double down like the gambler at the casino, right? We throw good money after bad because we've fallen in love with our original idea. So we, we have to not fall in love uh, which is a tough thing to do. This is just a perfect segue for Project Lifestyle. Now we're going to be talking about decision making and how that applies even in our personal life. Remember, on the Strategic Project Leader, we are all about elevating everything, like your career, your business as well. My goodness, I want to say Mike has already been awesome. He's already shared a lot of light around all the things I want to actually highlight. But just some key steps I want us to think about when it comes to effective decision making. Think about it as almost like a systematic approach to consider various options. We, we, we do this every day at home with our kids, you know, even decisions that actually have to do with people around us. The first step that I always leverage is identifying what exactly is the decision. Yeah. Yeah. What exactly is that decision that I need to make? So um, I have this phrase that I heard an executive say to me one time. Uh, he said, um, you have to love the problem first. And it, basically what, what he was saying was, uh, as humans, we sometimes have a rush to judgment. We have some situation we encounter and we, we quickly jump to a solution, but we actually haven't defined, wait, what's the problem we're trying to solve, right? So, uh, and part of that challenge is that um, we are like the carpenter who has a hammer and uh, everything is a nail. If you walk around with a hammer, right? In other words, you, you, you have this predisposition toward a certain solution, but actually good decision-making starts with forget about that predisposition and think well, what, what exactly is the problem we're trying to solve here, right? And once we understand that, that, that really changes the conversation. Don't start with, I'm good at X. I'm good at hammering nails. So everything to me looks like a nail, right? Instead we go, wait, 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 no, this this isn't that. This is a very different kind of project. What's the problem we're trying to solve? Love the problem first. Exactly. So be very specific about what needs to be addressed or resolved. That's point my point number one. Number two for me is get a data. Yeah. Get as much information as you can. And I always say probably put a time limit as well. You cannot just say, I'm going to gather information. We're going to do from now till the next six months. But put a time to it. But gather information that's relevant. That can help you, you know, get patterns and trends and see, okay, what exactly are experts saying? What exactly does past experience say? Get some form, do some form of research. And number three is identify alternatives. Well, I could said that before. Generate possible ranges of options that you can actually leverage to say, what exactly could actually happen if we do it this way or we do it another way? But make sure you have options. And this is a key piece that a lot of managers actually do not follow, especially when you need to present information to senior leaders as well. This pertains to work. Where you kind of say this kind of what the situation is, you present that, you haven't given them options. You need to say, this is a situation, but we have three options here. We can go with option one, but that's what the implication will be. We go with option two, that's what it is, and give them the tools so they can actually make the right decision. That's the same thing applies in your personal life. When you talk dealing with your spouse, even with your kids, give them options. But Micah said not too many. And ever the way your alternatives. That's number four. What options are there? And think about the potential risk. I think that's another piece that's really, really hard. Because at times you could say, I'm going to make a decision. And it could even be an example where you want to, you want to build a new home. 
and you feel, okay, I can either go for a $200,000 home, and then it means that I have the opportunity to renovate it and add something else to the back of it, and then we can grow into it. Or you can invest $600,000, and what does that mean? It means that you're probably going to be paying so much on your mortgage. You're going to be stressing the family. There's just so many things. It's still a home. Well, at least now you know what the options are. And then you can come together with your spouse or whoever it is you're making a decision with and say, what do you think? We've got these pieces and how do we actually go ahead with that? Number five is consider what the consequences are. I, I kind of um, um, said stuff that actually led to that. What exactly would be the consequence if we go whatever route and then make the decision? Because indecision, as we've heard, is a decision. And if you decide to do nothing about it, then again, that's an issue. Overall, what I tell my clients every day is take action. Because you can have the best of ideas. But the best of ideas are just ideas until they're actually executed. Take time and say, yes, I think it's 70% now. Let's go on. And like I said that, get a sandbox. Let us experiment on it. We're going to get the feedback and we're going to say this is kind of what it is. And then we can make informed decisions and say, let's pee it a little bit, just like the Kleenex guys. Who would have known that? Kleenex would have been a multinational, you know, a big, everyone uses it everywhere now. They've made loads of money from it. So it's not about the first idea or what you thought it could actually be used for. It's about what it morphs into. Let's think about Amazon. Amazon used to sell old books in the, in the garage, right? Today, what a day they talk about tech and everything they were just open to each of it until they become actually great above all you need to adapt and seek feedback i think that's absolutely great. i know Meg, you have somewhere to say what do you think about all that is there anything I actually missed that you want to add to that uh, yeah i'll just add i'll go back to the information gathering um i think we have to be open to different methods of information gathering so you know one of the things we rely on a lot is surveys and um, there's a limitation, a big limitation survey. So I want you to think about when you go to the doctor and the doctor asks you these days a bunch of questions about your lifestyle. Like, you know, my doctor, she asks, how many alcoholic drinks per week do you consume, Mike? Or do you text and drive, Mike? Well, I mean, who the heck says, yes, I text and drive? Or, or yeah, I have like 10 beers a week. Like, I mean, nobody, like, you know, Margaret Mead, the great anthropologist, she says, you know, what people say what they do and what they say they do are three completely different things, mm. right? And so we have to recognize that surveys don't always tell us how people actually behave. So we have to go out and actually observe people's behavior. I'm mm. very important for project managers to do is go see what are people actually doing, right? And when we observe them, what are we looking for? We're looking for where are those unmet needs, those pain points. And maybe most importantly, we're looking for workarounds. Where are people coming up with makeshift solutions? Because the solution they have currently isn't doing the job. You know, what is a workaround? It's the tennis balls on the bottom of an elderly person's walker, right? It's those things that customers are doing in a makeshift way, right? To get around some problem they've encountered. A workaround is like a blaring siren with flashing lights that says, your product, your service, your solution isn't doing the job. And here's an opportunity for improvement. That's really key. So how we gather information, get out there and go watch what people are doing. Don't just send them a survey. You'll get much richer information. And I would argue more accurate information that then becomes fodder for good decision making. I think that's really great. It's all about really seeing. You know, a lot of the time, as you said, it's we can, people can write anything. But when you see them, and I love the piece, you know, there was a show that used to be on TV where, you know, these leaders who are like the CEOs go off the I feel, you know, they come to the shop floor. They kind of disguise and no one actually knows they go and they, they, walk, they watch people do the job. And then they uncover so many things, right? It's all about the actual doing it's actually time now we've said it before now it's time for you to get your questions answered and so we've got any questions put in the comment because we're going to be going right into it let's know what questions you've got fantastic question time the first question mike what has been the greatest challenge you've had through your career and what key decisions have you had to make through that to get to where you are today? I mean, for me, I think, you know, one of the biggest, um, I, I have the benefit of a job where I have an incredible amount of autonomy, right? I get to decide what projects 
I want to work on, right? I, they're not always things that are told to me. Sometimes I get told, you know, you know, that Mike, you have to create a class on this subject or you have to do that. But a lot of times I have the autonomy to do that. Of course, then the question becomes, how do I allocate my time? Which projects do I say yes to? Which do I say no to? That's often been the most challenging thing in my career is to decide where do I want to spend my time? <clears throat> and for me, I, I think about it not simply about <clears throat> the subject matter. I really think about who would I be working with if I decide to do that project? And for me, those relationships really matter. You know, this might be something that might not be the most, uh, the, 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 the first subject or first topic I'd be interested in doing. But the person or the people I would get to work with are people, oh my goodness, I would really love to have the opportunity to work with them. And I think that might benefit me career-wise down the line to work with them. That's been a big criteria for me. And I, it's led me to have some great collaborations and opportunities, um, even sometimes when initially the project itself didn't look so appealing. So for me, that's been my biggest challenge is figuring out how to decide to spend my time and what projects to embrace and which ones, frankly, to say no to, because if you never say no, you know, you end up with an overcrowded schedule and you don't get anything done well. <clears throat> I think that's actually good. And that's, I think that's a, ties into another question that I want to know. So how do you manage your time? Yeah, not well. <laughs> not oh, well. No. Even having said that, I mean, I struggle, right, with, with managing my time and I juggling three kids, my wife, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it is challenging to manage my time. Uh, for me, you know, I think the biggest thing I do is try to use what might otherwise be um, dead time effectively, mm -hmm. right? So that time on a plane, the time on a train, right? Not that I'm necessarily, I'm always doing work, but I, you know, rather than just streaming a show, sometimes I'll stream a show just to chill out and relax, but maybe I'll read a book, you know, um, I'll always bring books with me either digitally or in hard copy or academic papers, stuff like that, and try to use that dead time. Or, you know, I will, you know, I, I pretty much always will have, you know, my tablet or my laptop with me so I can read and do other things. So there's a lot of dead time. I mean, I had a daughter who played ice hockey. I spent a lot of time sitting around waiting for practice to end or waiting for her to get dressed or undressed in the locker room. And I could have just sat there and done nothing or been on my phone scrolling, or I could actually try to use the time. And I found that dead time, if you will, which there's a lot of it as a parent, <laughs> you'll find um, waiting for your kids. I tried to use that effectively, not when I was with them, right? You want to fully embrace being able to watch them, coach them, et cetera but use all that other time and then travel time. Use it effectively. I know that's definitely awesome. We've got another question. Yes. When it comes to decision making, Mike, we know that it has to be a lot of communication. And so what role does effective communication play in enhancing team performance and facilitating critical decision making? But a tie there is how can they how can teams really elevate that communication to ensure that they can actually effectively share with the information, the data, so they can pretty much we can uh, get to effective solutions? Yeah, two, two big problems we have to think about. One is that when we get together in a group, um, you know, we all are aware of groupthink, right? We can think alike too much, right? We lose our independence. We get influenced by the people around us. So we have to protect against that, give people space to perhaps, you know, write down their ideas before they come to the meeting, before they've heard other people's ideas. You know, we always hear about brainstorming. I'm a big fan of brainstorming, but I actually believe the most effective, and there's research to back this up, the best way to brainstorm is to start by giving people time before yeah. they talk, write down some ideas so they're not influenced by others. So influence is, is important to manage and to protect against. And then the second piece um, is we know that when we bring people together in groups, People tend to focus on information we all already share and, and know. And what we don't do enough of is uncovering what that one team member knows that no one else knows, right? So we, we call this the shared information bias. This bias to talk about the common ground sounds so nice and comfy. We should talk about it. No, no, but if we go to the common ground too quickly, what we lose is what you know, Fuller, that I don't know, that, mm. I, that I'd like to learn from you. So we have to be aware of that. So those two things, beware of social influence and beware of the shared information bias that are inhibitors to good communication. 
uh, that can be really, really key. I'll give you one, one, one other thing. There's a Bob Pittman is the founder of MTV, went on to be a CEO of a number of companies. And um, he has this phrase, he says, you know, when people come to him with a proposal um, and they're really enthusiastic about it and they're telling him why he should give them the green light. He says to them, what did the dissenter say? And he said, when he first started asking the question, people would say, well, everybody's on board, Bob. And he'd say, it is impossible in an organization this large and complex for everyone to agree that that can't be possible. There must be people who have a different perspective. And if you haven't heard them, you're not doing your job. So go, come back. Once you found those people and tell me what they say, I still might give you the green light, but I want to make yeah. sure I know, right? That was so the lovely little technique, right? For making sure that, you know, you don't let people tell you too quickly. Everyone's on board. Because that's just never true. <laughs> that's just never know. true. Well, I think we've got time for probably one final question. This really ties into the last one, but this is a case where where you've got leaders who you you can already see that they're about to make a potentially bad decision. How can project managers or professionals help convince leaders to go through an alternate route? And not be seen as though that they're actually obstructive. So the answer is not in public to tell them that they're, you know, that they're all wrong, right? So don't shame them. Don't put them in a position where you're embarrassing them, right? Um, so first is it's it don't confront them with, you know, you're wrong and this is why. I would always say you're much better off asking questions rather than making those kind of declarative statements, you know, you're wrong and here's why, right? And then be mindful of who that leader is. Is it a leader where you'd be much more effective in a one-on-one -on -one over coffee talking to them versus challenging them in the meeting? There might be other people, they're fine with you saying in a meeting, hey, I have a question here. There's others where it might be more useful to do that in a one-on-one -on -one meeting or others where they, maybe you should email them first, give them a chance to think about it and then have a conversation, right? So know your audience, when you're trying to make that argument that, hey, we're about to move in the wrong direction. And then give them options, right? What else what might we do that would still help them achieve the goal they're trying to achieve, right? Rather than saying, just don't do it, try to give them, okay, but here's what we might do that still would help you fulfill your objectives here, right? Very, very important, right? And if you don't have that answer, go, go talk to people, right? Go get some other ideas on that, right? Really important. Um, very, very important to do. And then I think the other thing um, that's really important if you, if you see that we're about to go off in the wrong direction is to help people imagine, right? Um, and a little imagination here. Um, how might that unfold in a way that could be, right, unwelcome, right? Helping them imagine that, right? Not just saying, oh my God, the sky is falling, like it's terrible, but just sort of, say, you know, and I think you do that best through the questions you ask, rather than painting a picture of doom and gloom. Fantastic. Mike, brace yourself. This is coming. <laughs> I love this. This is really, really great because this ties back into that, but this is dealing with the team dynamics. How can teams effectively manage conflicts and difference in opinions during decision-making process to maintain a healthy team dynamics and arrive at the best possible outcome. Yeah, so uh, very important, I think, um, is to think carefully about um, who uh, is engaging in that conflict, when and how, right? So who, we talked a little bit already about it not always being the same naysayer, right? But making sure that different people are embracing this role. Um, the second, the when though, is something we often don't talk about. So. I think it's really important for conflict to be constructive that we hold off on critique until we've had some discussion of what some different avenues or paths might be. So if we, if you put an idea out there full and we immediately begin to critique it and engage in a debate, what happens is not only do you get defensive, but others in the room go, holy smokes, did you see what just happened to Fola? And they, mm -hmm. they get quiet, right? They don't want to put their ideas out there. So um, at IDEO, the great product design firm, they call this deferring judgment waiting a little bit before you dive in and critique, get some ideas out there, right? And during that process, very important um, to shift from a, a yeah, but mentality to what I call, to what 
improv comedians call the yes and mentality. Yeah, but is always starting with yeah, but that won't work because yeah. the yes and mentality says yes, Fola, and we could enhance your idea. Like that. Right? At Pixar, they call this plussing people's ideas as opposed mm-hmm. to just rejecting people's ideas, right? Very important technique. Yes and, not just yeah, but that will really help us. Oh my goodness. That's just been so awesome. You have shared great nuggets, great actionable steps. We can go on and on. Just remember, first of all, in decision-making, you have to think about your ideas. There's so many tools, all opportunity cost. My goodness, Mike, I cannot say thank you enough. I want to thank you for spending your morning with me. I know that at school today, you're actually talking with your alumni there's so much going on in boston today so i want to say thank you for taking your time to be here but i want people to know how can they actually connect with you sure i mean uh, i you can find me on the web at uh, www.professormichaelroberto.com that's my website Um, there's a link there to my blog that i keep but of course you can also follow me on social media um, on twitter um, on linkedin um, you know, find me there. I also have a professional page on Facebook. So uh, lots of places to find me on social. I love to uh, share out uh, some of my thought leadership and some of the research I'm doing and the research of others that I really admire around the globe uh, via my blog and via social. So I hope people uh, reach out and follow and, um, and of course can always send me comments or questions via those social channels as well. That's right. That's definitely awesome. Listen, there are key people you need to be following. When we talk about becoming better as a leader, becoming better as a professional, you want to make sure you're soaking like a sponge. You know, you get in and you say, what exactly is Mike is, is Mike thinking today? You've got a great resource. You've got a leader who is definitely going to be there to help you and support you through your journey as well. And above all, I want to thank each and every one of you for spending time with me and Mike this morning. But without any further ado, I think about this with all you've actually heard. It's all about execution. You can make decisions or indecisions, but still you need to take action. So what will be one key thing that you're going to be taking action on today? How are you going to start thinking about your decision-making process? How are you going to start tackling even your team decision-making processes as well? Are you going to now be more open to say, oh, goodness, I'm not just going to be so abrupt at those meetings. I'm going to take it offline. I'm going to be more intentional when I bring my ideas forward. Are you going to take all of this into perspective, but I want to know one piece in the comment that you are going to be doing that you're going to be leveraging. Goodness, a famous mind once said that he wants to put a ding on the planet, but I say together, we are going to make a positive dent in the world. So take action today, but most importantly, remember that I always say this again, remember that you are your life's project manager. The most important project you can actually ever walk on is you. Take action daily and execute. Execute on those things and you can then create not just a career that you want because beyond that is a life of fulfillment as well. Mike, once again, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much as well and make sure that you enjoy the rest of your day. See you guys same time next week and have yourself a good one.